Hello, I'm Black Bright. Welcome to my channel. First time you're passing through, you know the drill. You can either subscribe, you can like, put the thumbs up, thumbs down, and you can share if you like. Um, if you want to, if you think other people will be interested. Um, I'm going to do a roundup first of all, and then I'm going to do something separate about um, immigration and those people who or immigrants whether they're legal immigrants, yeah, I'm talking about legal immigrants, um, what their situation is as of January 2021. But that's in the other one. But for now, um, I'm going to talk about a little roundup of the news since last night till this morning. And yeah, I'm going to start off with how, um, according to one of the papers, Ethnic minorities are being pushed onto the coronavirus wards. They're being taken off of their usual wards and being placed onto the coronavirus wards. Now, this is despite all the media going around saying that um, blacks and ethnic minorities are more susceptible to catching coronavirus. So are they protecting their staff? Are they thinking about the welfare or the well-being of their staff, if that is what they're doing. Um, I will put the link in, but apparently um, a lot of the staff are worried. Needless to say, they're terrified. They're being placed in a tenuous position. I'm not quite sure if that would constitute constructive dismissal. I mean, if, if the health authority know that you are more at risk, wouldn't you put, I can understand them doing it 50-50, but when it's disproportionately blacks and ethnic minorities, that's not quite right. But then I was also wondering, is that the ratio anyway, or is it more visible now that the situation is a bit more dangerous? I mean, we don't know if the ratio has always been more ethnic minorities to white. But now, in this particular situation, because it's so dangerous, it's now up in their faces. They're much more aware of their vulnerability. And maybe that's what it is. I don't know what the normal ratio is, but they are concerned. And they I don't know if somebody's speaking on their behalf or what, but I think they'd have to have a good argument as to why the ratio is so different. Is it because they have more black and ethnic minorities? available. So um, yeah, so that's being looked into. And so that is my first piece of news. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, they're overrepresented on the coronavirus wards, they're overrepresented, well, blacks and ethnic minorities are overrepresented in prisons, they're overrepresented in um, mental institutions, but they're underrepresented in management positions, um, counsellors in local government, clinical and health research, and the tech and the technology industry. So we don't just want to be a race that is overrepresented in un, um, unattractive fields, fields that nobody else wants to do, or nobody else wants to be in. Nobody wants to be in a position where they're overrepresented in prisons. Nobody wants to be in a position where they're overrepresented in mental institutions. And similarly, we don't want to be overrepresented on the coronavirus wars. We want to be overrepresented in something much more favourable. So I just want to talk about that. Ten doctors have died of ethnic minorities. Um, I don't know what the ratio is. Once again, taken out of context, it's very difficult to comment. But... Um, Yes, so I'll, I'll leave it there for now. So what else is there? Parents to become teachers during the lockdown. How, how does it work when parents who have literacy problems? Are they left um, for the children to teach them? Or do they, um, are they just there to monitor to make sure that the child actually does the work, not really able to check it, but trusting the child to know that she or he knows what they're doing? Um, it might be interesting to see if the child learns better while they're, while they're being schooled at home 
that would be an interesting concept. Yes, they have to go online and do all of those courses, but at the same token, it's like a one-to-one. They're getting individual attention, and if they've got supportive parents, whether they can read or write, it doesn't really make a difference. As long as the parents are supporting them, are there with them, um, the, you know, helping them to understand and the child can help the parents to understand what they're doing. They, it could actually be a bonding exercise. So it'd be very interesting to see how their marks are or how they fare um, being schooled from home. Of course, you're going to have some parents who don't give a toss about their children. They didn't when they sent them off to school and they don't now they're at home. You know, and that is a shame, but, you know, it's an unfair world. Um, yeah, and you've heard about the Nova Scotia gunman. Went out on a rampage, dressed up in a police uniform, took a marked car, started shooting people at random. During the lockdown, I tell you, this lockdown affects people differently. Some people, they feel trapped. And it would seem, I mean... I don't know where he got the uniform from. I don't know if he killed somebody and put the uniform on or what. I don't know where he got the marked car from. It doesn't say. But he, he killed one person. It looks like, oh, that's not enough. Let me go around and kill a few more. In the end, he ends up killing 16 people. Apparently, for no reason, random, random shootings. It's kind of scary in a way because sometimes you'd like to have answers wouldn't you you'd like to think oh he did it because he lost his job he did it because he just had a row with his girlfriend he did it because he hasn't got any money but when you know they don't seem to come up with some kind of reason why he would go out and do that it's kind of unsettling because you don't know and to be honest, anybody, we don't know what's going on in anybody's lives. Anybody could just go crazy, just be tipped over the edge. You've seen these you've seen these movies, or whether it's in movies or real life, where somebody nags and nags and nags, and the husband's just nodding, 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 and yeah, nag, 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 nodding, nodding, yes dear, yes dear, yes dear. And then one day he just flips. And likewise, a woman. You know, a man keeps hitting her and beating her and doing everything year after year or how long it ever takes. And one day she, she kills him or shoots him or stabs him while he's sleeping. You know, some people, we, do know, we don't know what tips them over the edge. The same way with this guy. We don't know what's happened. But anyway, last night I was listening to Donald Trump. I don't even know why I listened to that man. I think I, think I find him fascinating. I mean, he is, he requires so much praise. He wants all the credit. And he just talks and then he kind of makes these little snidey remarks at people. And then, oh, you know, he's talking about we're the king of ventilators. We're the best in tests. We've done the most tests. We've got the most tests. I mean, it's it's, it's just fascinating you know I I listened to him and I listened to him for the whole hour and I, I think it was an hour and one minute or something last night and I was just thinking to myself you know he's just absolutely I mean he really doesn't have a clue and he talks about these deals and he uses phrases like um oh we'll win as though it's some kind of competition, or we'll get that deal. I mean, it's got no empathy about what is actually going on. I mean, he talks about it, but it's all it's it's in a way that when he talks about the coronavirus and the impact, it's in a very superficial way. It's almost like his role in all of this is to be the best at everything. Oh, you know, I've got to be, I, we, America's got to be the country with the most ventilators. We've got to be the country with the most, you, that's done the most tests. We have to have the most beds. And we, you know, it's, it's so far removed from the people on the ground. But, you know, I do find him fascinating. I read, I look at him and I think, 
I don't even have words, to be honest. I just listen. And then, you know, sometimes if he says a term or he says a phrase, I'll pick it up. I'll pick up on it. And I might make my little comment on it. But, you know. And then, yeah, I I picked up on it. The the king of ventilators. Doesn't he just tweet it? He tweets it around the world. King, King of ventilators. Honestly. So, yes, he was saying his, con- well, first he refers to the um, to the coronavirus as a scourge and a plague. Then he says, we conducted the most tests, the largest country, the biggest tester in the world. I'm tired, but we have to win, right? What does he, what do we have to win? What is it that he, he wants to win? You know, is he winning over the virus or is he winning over the people? I mean, he makes his statements and I don't think he gives it much thought. And it's when he moves from the script. When he's reading from the script, he's fine. But then he'll he'll make a little remark that's not on the script. And it's usually detrimental. I mean, somebody else might pick up about we'll win. Win what? Anyway, um... So he, they procured millions of swaps. And then he takes out, you know, the Q-tip, <laughs> takes it out, and he compares it to the swab that, you know, that you're going to be tested with. And he's like, oh, they look very similar, don't they? I don't know what all the fuss is about. But you get his kind of point, you know what I mean? Um then he says we, there's 500 million masks, um, N95 masks, so they can be sterilised 20 times. So that means you can get 20 uses out of it. And he's talking about um, all the washing of the hands and he's soiling it. He's, he's had enough of it because he's calling it ad nauseum. Ad nauseum means it started to become irritating now. Um, that's another word he used away from the script. And he also doesn't feel it's necessary to order people to stay inside because they're intelligent people, which you could say. But I think if if the instructions were clear, we wouldn't have people on the street. It's just that they're ambiguous. And like I'm always saying, they're deliberately ambiguous so that, you know, some people can use their discretion on how and how to treat people and when to treat people in a certain way. So Richard Branson billionaire has got a network net worth of 3.8 billion and virgin airlines in australia in particular is going under and needs to be bailed out what is he saying he needs to get a loan for 500 million from the public cash he's not taking it out of his 3.8 billion do you i mentioned it last week he says his um, eight, the staff for eight weeks must take, must um, go without pay. Then he's stashing 1.1 billion of his, of his stocks, of his Galactica stocks, in a tax haven in British Virgin Islands. But I guess that's how you get rich. You get rich by not using your money. And even he's apparently he has got a, a rescue fund of 250 million, but that's still not coming out of his pot, it's coming out of a separate pot, and that's to save his staff. So, like I said, that's how the rich make rich they don't use their own money, they have all these different pots of money that do all different things, and they use it as and they swap it over and they move it here and they move it there, and they don't end up losing. That's why they're rich. Somebody who's got maybe a reasonable amount of money, but not much, they'd probably end up using their own money. They probably think, oh, I don't want to take out a loan because I'm going to have to pay it back and this interest and that interest. But rich people, that's how they survive. They survive on loans. America is riddled with debt. And that is how, I don't know how it survives, but maybe like I said yesterday, maybe the Chinese are going to bail them out. I have no idea. So that's Richard um, Branson. 
what else have we got? We've got, um, should people dress up for video conferences? Now, that's supposed to be a topic in the news. Um, I know the other day we had a video conferencing, a, a little meeting, and one of the women, she hadn't, I think she had on a pyjama, not a pyjama, her dressing gown. Another woman was dressed okay. I don't, I don't know. I think I had a jumper on, and another woman was looked okay. She had her glasses on, but you know, people hadn't really made a really good effort. And I, I think it does say something. I think it does lose the tone of the professionalism if you aren't dressed. Even though it's a video conference, I think you should really see it as a meeting. Your views would be appreciated. I don't think just because you're at home and you're not working that you should just show up on your um, on the video, not dressed properly. I don't know how many of you saw that video with this guy. He would put a shirt on, but he hadn't put on any trousers. And he just had a video conference and he'd forgotten to switch it off. And he got up and they all saw him in his underwear, in his undershorts, and he's there scratching his butt and everything. And they were trying to get hold of him. And in the end, they were trying to screen through the thing, but he couldn't hear. So he probably put it on mute or something. And they had to call him in the end, and he was so embarrassed. So I think, you know, apart from that, apart from not dressing, because somebody said to me, what do you... I can never see what you've got on underneath your top. I can only see your top. And I'm like, but why would you want to see at the bottom? And I always think to myself, ah, should I bother to put on something underneath it or should I just put a top on? But I always think, supposing somebody knocks on the door, you know, supposing I get a call, supposing like sometimes I forget something and I get up and I forget myself. Can you imagine that? Well, I guess I could do the video over again. But I kind of think about things like that. So, yeah, I think um, talking about video conferences, I think it's a good idea to dress appropriately. You don't have to dress up to the nines, but just look half decent. Make sure your hair's combed and brushed. Put on a little, you know, something, something to make you look half decent and alive. And yeah, so that's that one. Um so Philip Rutman sues Pretty Patel. Now, this has been going on since February. It was in place, but now it's gone ahead now. Apparently, um, he was going to sue for constructive dismissal because of her behaviour, and he felt forced to leave. He's the home, he's the permanent secretary for the Home Office. And he felt forced to leave because her behaviour was abominable, apparently. Apparently, she swore at people, belittled them, shouted at them, um, kept on making repeated demands and stuff like that. So he um, left. He felt compelled to leave then. Anyway, um, after speaking to his lawyer, um, they, I don't know what's been going on since, but now he's got a case. And also... Uh -huh. With constructive dismissal, it only carries a limit of £86,000. But he's now gone for unlawful dismissal. And he's factored in um, the fact he's been punished for whistleblowing because he was the one that raised it about her behaviour. So he felt he was being punished by her because of the way she spoke to him because he blew the whistle on her. So they've compounded the two. So not only the unfair dismissal, but being punished for whistleblowing, which is quite serious, that is. And that carries unlimited um, compensation. So we'll have to see how that goes. Um, I'll keep an eye on that. What else? Oh, and also, um, I was thinking that she's on, what, £1,000 an hour? I know it's like it's not like for seven days a week, um, you know, seven hours a day, five days a week. But she is on one, it does translate into £1,000 an hour. And I think sometimes when people have a high salary, they feel entitled to speak to people any way they want. And that's not how it should be. That is arrogance. So, um, and, you know, when you think about how they're actually treating um, these, the, under the new under the new legislation, um, 
allowing people under a certain salary, only people under a certain salary to enter the UK. I think it's under 25,600. You know, it equates people. It gives value to people who earn more as opposed to how substantive the job is, what value that job is to society. And rich people, that's how they value people. They value people based on what they earn. And not even just rich people, in the hierarchy of most organisations, those at the top treat those at the bottom like doo-doo. And the ones at the bottom are the ones that are keeping the wheels uh, moving, keeping everything in motion. Do you think, like, as, as administrators, if we didn't do our job, do you think they could produce reports for, 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 for the top guns? They couldn't. They depend on us little guys to give them the data so that they can produce their reports. Do you think they've got time to trawl through stacks and stacks of information and record all this data and all these dates? They don't have time to do all of that. They, the people at the bottom, they produce all of that work. They give it to them in a summarised format. And so when they go to their big meetings, they can just say, oh, blah, 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 as though they've done the work. And yet they treat the people at the bottom like crap. And this is what this this is a typical example of what seems to have happened with this pretty Patel scenario, that the workers have been treated disrespectfully and they've been treated like crap. And also, not only them, but so Richard um, Putnam as well. So Richard Rutman, sorry. So Richard Rutman, oh, I'm getting all right. So Philip Rutman. So um, so he's felt compelled to resign from his permanent secretary um, of the Home Office post because the complaints he received against Priti Patel of shouting, swearing, belittling, Lynn, making unreasonable and repeated demands made staff feel intimidated. And he drew it to senior's attention. So she gave him a hard time, apparently. So that is that. And what else have we got? We've got 43 crew members floating around on, on the sea for 14 days. These are Jamaican crew members. Um, they, was, they was due to go to Jamaica and they arrived on the 6th of April. At that point, the port was closed. All the borders to get to Jamaica was closed. And so whoever was... Um, governing the ports or the borders would not allow them in and so messages had been sent to Andrew Holness he was in this big meeting so he could he didn't know anything about it by the time he came out they were already um, going to Portugal to not Portugal someplace Port Antonio to refuel I think it was Port Antonio they went to refuel and they had to come all the way back to Southampton so what um and so well what the prime minister is saying andrew holness he's saying if he had known of course they would have been allowed in but you see they don't tell the little guys it's the same thing people at the top do not feel they have to filter down information to the bottom and it's the people at the bottom who end up doing most of the stuff now if you say Look, nobody's allowed in. Um, if you say to uh, the person at the bottom, no one's allowed in. These ports are closed. The um, borders are closed. You don't say, but we're expecting a, a, a ship to come in. Um, a 43 Jamaicans are always expecting this. They are allowed in. You don't give them any exceptions or you don't say to them, look, if somebody comes and you're not sure, give us a call but don't turn them away. They don't say that. So these people, they take instructions, literally. They don't feel as though they can use their initiative. And sometimes most people at the bottom, they're told not to use their initiative. They're told to follow orders. So these people at the bottom, they've been told nobody's to pass through. So they send these poor guys back. 14 days on the sea. And they've got that journey to go back again. Oh, I wouldn't want to do that. So, 
they arrived back in the UK at Southampton. I think it was either last night or this morning, um, Jamaican time, 4 a.m. Jamaican time. So that's probably about 9, 10 o'clock our time last night. So, yeah, that is that. 43 crew members aboard the Marella Discovery 2. What else have we got? Digital adultery. What do you think about that? Do you think there is such a thing as digital adultery? How does it happen? I mean, some people, they think that you can only be unfaithful if you're physically unfaithful. You know, two people getting it on bonking away. They don't think that if you are um, doing video, FaceTime, having sex online or watching each other have sex online or sexing themselves or whatever it is they do. They don't think that um, sexting, you know, sending sexual texts to each other is being unfaithful. They don't think that flirting online is being unfaithful. They don't think that... Um, Pornography. Well, I don't have pornography because you're just watching it. You're not really participating. So, but some people believe that paid pornography is being unfaithful. But what are these people doing during this lockdown, Midian? Mid people during lockdown. They've gone on to these web dating websites. <laughs> their, old, their poor little wife don't steer. And, and it's not just wife, it's spouses. So we just say spouse because women are doing it too. Spouse downstairs minding their own business thinking, oh, you know, my wife's a bit quiet up there. That's nice. Give me a little break. I'm having a little time to myself. That time they're up there on the on the computer chatting and doing whatnot with people online. They've got this um, dating site called Illicit Encounters, and it's specifically for people who are in relationships or married and they have an illicit contact, encounter with somebody on the other side. Can you imagine? And so a lot of people, apparently, there's this website um, called Gleedon and it's an extramarital dating website. So it's a bit like illicit, it's a bit like illicit, whatever it was called, illicit encounters. This is called Gleedon and they reckon they've seen an increase of 70% in subscriptions. People ain't happy, I'm telling you. People ain't happy with who they're with. Not all of them, of course. There's lots of people who are happy, but there's a lot of people who aren't, and that's what they're doing. Now they're on lockdown, you think they have to behave themselves. Ah, <laughs> oh, where there's a will, there's a way, love. They ain't behaving themselves at all up in their room or wherever they are. Some of them even say they're going exercising. When they're gone out exercising, they're on these on these websites. They've got 30 minutes, haven't they, to exercise. So they're on these websites. Or they'll say, oh, darling, I'll do the shopping for you. Let me go and do the shopping. You can stay at home. Keep, put your feet up. They go off and have a quick bonk around the corner and they're back. That's if the person is local, of course. But I'm just saying, you know, they're calling it the digital adultery, and that is what people are doing. So, the fact that you've got your husband or your wife at home don't mean squat. They can still misbehave if they are so inclined. You have some serial people, them just can't stick with woman, one woman. They make out like they can, you know. To the woman, oh, yeah, you know, is you is only you me there with, you know, it's only you me there with. <laughs> That time they have whoever and whoever, and they think say I eat that. <laughs> oh boy, if I laugh, I finish. Anyway, partners who are serial cheaters cannot be faithful are now turning to dating sites like illicit encounters to find their partners for virtual sex with the intention of carrying it on after the lockdown lifts. So then, then groom in the relationship, you know. So they're on the dating site and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, this lockdown soon shift. And once, you know, they'll have virtual sex with anticipation of having a real thing where the lockdown is up. So, you know, your wife is thinking, oh, yeah, my old man. 
what you know he's been behaving himself he ain't going out he can't go out he can't go and see no one it's just me and David <laughs> same like with the same like with the man think said the woman is you know all his well the lockdown glad enough especially some of those possessive man glad said the woman they're warm <laughs> tell me don't know what she get up to honestly anyway um they've got facetime sex is not as gratifying as a real thing but it's better than nothing infidelity is easier to detect during the lockdown things that would normally be overlooked the antenna goes up during a lockdown because it's like sometimes you'll go upstairs or you might hear you know they think they're talking quietly sometimes these people think you know sometimes these men think they're slick you know and they put s stupid names on their um on their mobile like john when it's really a woman's name and they think the people are idiots <laughs> they're, they're calling these people or texting them or whatever it is they're doing or doing their voice chats and they don't know so sometimes you can hear every word when you're downstairs depending how thin the walls are anyway so some will still use shopping arguments that's the biggest one you know some of these um some whether it's male or female they'll instigate an argument just so they can say cha we're gone like a cool laugh we're gonna do their little bit when they come back and they're all feeling relieved and nice and everything that's kind of coming back to push their frowsy self on you this isn't my personal experience you know i'm just saying anyway um what else is this secretive about the phone I don't think being secretive about the phone is evidence of infidelity, even though sources say it is. Because I just think your phone is personal. And I don't think necessarily, I mean, it's different if you say, look, you know, give somebody a phone and say, look, um, look up this for me or whatever. But I wouldn't give my phone to somebody so they can go through it, even though I've got nothing to hide. I just think it's my phone. But that's just me. Um, so you can also tell if somebody's getting itchy feet when they become resentful about being with you, when they start saying, you know, uh, you know, finding all kind of fault and, you know, finding, it, you know, they're angry and frustrated that you're around all the time and they kind of get irritated with you and stuff. Um, some believe everything non-physical is allowed, e.g. nude photos. You get some people, they're sending nude photos. Now, suppose those nude photos get on Facebook or end up somewhere where they're not supposed to end up. Videos, sexting, sexy phone calls, chatting to exes. Now, is chatting to an ex, is that being unfaithful? A lot of people say, oh, well, I'm on good terms with my ex. You can't tell me not to speak to my ex. There's nothing in it. But is that, inf is that infidelity? Or does it depend on the relationship? Or does it depend on how they speak to each other? Just asking. Last and not. Flirting on social media, porn, dating sites. An extramarital dating app called Bleedon has recently seen a 70% increase in their subscriptions during the coronavirus lockdown. I think it's fine as long as you know that your partner will not end it if she or he finds out. If they, if you think they will, do you think it's worth it? And that's, I think that's what you always have to think about, the worst case scenario. Okay, it's fun. You're going off, getting your end off, and you feel kind of, you have that temporary satisfaction. But if you really, really, really care about the person that you're with, and if that person, whether it's male or female, was to say, look, done, when they find out. I hope you're not going to start pleading and bawling and crying and begging and all that kind of crap. Because really and truly, you should have thought about that before you decide to do it. You couldn't really care about the person that you're with if you're willing to do that. So therefore, if you are willing to do that, you have to be willing to take the consequences. Okay? And that's all for now. Bye-bye.